falling apart. Falling apart. How's everyone doing this morning? Good. It's Friday. Yes. Skit night tonight. Anybody excited about that? I'm excited. Although I do have to make a confession, I don't have the picture of it this morning with switching laptops, I've had a little issue with my pictures, but I actually sustained a very significant injury in skit night. So do be careful, uh, and, and Randy remembers this well, but there was a skit we were doing and, and, and at the end of the skit I was supposed to run off the stage and through the doors and I did, and I did it so well I kept going and I ran right into a stairwell. I tripped and uh, hit this bone right here. Um, and so I had a pretty good black eye for the rest of camp. Uh, they wanted to take me to the hospital, but my parents uh, said, no, no, just, just put him to bed. He'll be all right. <laughs> it's a true story. He can confirm that. How many of you, um, how many of you like bread? Any bread? All right, we got some bread people. There's just something about bread that's just, it's just so satisfying and it's amazing. And there's all kinds of bread and, and, and I like lots of different kinds of bread. But I like bread particularly when it's made with some sugar. Mm. And you form this amazing dough. Amen. And then you drop it in the fryer. Yes. Yes. And you're riding down the road and you see something like this. Oh, how many, of your, how many of your breakfast was that good this morning? Yeah, I didn't think so. What line did you get in, Colin? <laughs> All right. There's something about that hot now sign that just draws us in. It's, it's almost like it's wrong to drive by when the light's on, isn't it? <laughs> because you know that means there are hot, fresh, amazing donuts that will melt in your mouth and satisfy you like few other things in life. Bacon. Bacon. All right. I will admit, he's right. Bacon, bacon would be close, but this fits in better with the message this morning. So, you see, I think there's there's sort of a, a message for us and a reminder in this little message on this sign because of what it says there. Hot now, because what I've learned in life is that that life is filled with hot now signs. And not all of them are at donut shops. You see, God created pleasure. Pleasure is God's idea. The capacity that you have to experience pleasure, to enjoy and take delight in that hot, fresh donut. That's a gift from God. All right, God created pleasure. Pleasure is God's idea. All right, so pleasure is not wrong. But Satan will always tempt you to fulfill your cravings or desires for pleasure outside of the boundaries that God has set. And for whatever reason, we have a tendency to yield to life's hot now signs, to seek out those things. And I often ask, why is it are we so prone to do the very things that we know we should not do? And here's why the wisest man who ever lived, the authority on the subject, said this, stolen bread tastes sweet. Stolen bread tastes sweet. Your sin can be really amazing in the moment, can't it? It can be really fun. It can be exciting. It can be amazing. Stolen bread tastes sweet sweet. Whether it's eating the whole box of donuts, I won't ask you to raise your hand, but it's just so easy to lose track, isn't it, when they're hot and fresh? Or maybe it was when you decided not to do your own work at school, but to turn in someone else's work. And that A felt so good at first, didn't it? But deep in your heart you knew it really wasn't yours. Or maybe it was the pleasure of the intoxication or the passion of that forbidden sexual experience. If we're honest, sin feels really good in the moment. And our flesh, our flesh is weak. And if we don't recognize that we have a tendency to give into life's hot now signs, we're going to find ourselves in trouble. And if you don't think that, that you are at risk. I want you to consider with me this morning the life of a man who loved God. All right? This man was a protector of sheep. He was a shepherd. And he was a diligent and good shepherd. 
This man was a slayer of giants. He was anointed by God. He was a skilled musician. He was a fearless warrior and a passionate worshiper of God. How many of you ladies are thinking, I need to find a guy like this? Right? I mean, does not exist, probably has every, some of you have lists, right? <laughs> See, I've been around long enough to know how these things work. <laughs> Guys, I just want you to know, you, you, you probably aren't making the cut. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> of course, I'm talking about who? David. David. King David. And it came a time and a place in King David's life, although he was a man after God's own heart, a man who loved God deeply. He encountered one of life's hot now signs. If you have your Bible this morning, 2 Samuel chapter 11 is where we're going to be for a little bit. And as we come to 2 Samuel chapter 11, we're going to encounter a scene that's really not the highlight of, of, of David's life, but, but God has included it in his word because there's a powerful, powerful reminder for us in it. And so let's just read the first couple verses and, and then we'll work through this chapter. It says, In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all of Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabath. But David remained at Jerusalem. And then verse 2 says, It happened. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof of a from the roof, a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. Let's just think about verse 2 there for a minute. So here it is. It says, it happened. I, I want you to notice those first two, it happens, because here's the thing, it always happens, doesn't it? You will experience temptation in life. All of us experience temptation. Jesus was tempted. And it's not sin to be tempted. It just means you're normal, you're human. It happened. What happened? David gets up from his nap, he goes out on the rooftop to stretch and look out over the city, and then he looks down the street, and there's this woman taking a bath, right? And he thinks, wow, she looks really good. And so David has to make a choice. You see, sin and temptation, it can be so appealing, it can be so alluring in the moment that we can forget that it isn't what it seems. The word alluring means this. It means the quality of being powerfully and mysteriously attractive or fascinating. Now I know some of you guys think that describes you. <laughs> Let me read that again. The quality of being powerfully and mysteriously attractive or fascinating. <laughs> you know it's true. But that's exactly what sin is like, isn't it? There's this mysterious, fascinating power that it seems to have. Why? Because stolen bread, what? Tastes sweet. So David wakes up from his nap and he encounters one of these hot now signs. He probably had no expectation or no intention of encountering this situation. But there it was and he has a choice to make. He has to make a decision. And I think David probably thought about it for about a tenth of a second. And then David makes a decision and he goes downstairs and he finds some of his people and he says, there's this woman down the street, I need you to get her number for me. Okay? I'm going to bring the story into modern life a little bit for you so that it comes out of the pages and into our experience. So he says, get me her number. Find out who she is. I don't know her name. I don't know her story. I need to find out who th this is her. You know, she's three houses down. So David's people get on it and they come back to him and they say, David, um, her name's Bathsheba. David said, oh, that's great. She is the wife of Uriah. Da David, the wife. David, the wife. Wife of Uriah. Oh, and David, you're married. More than once. <laughs> We're not even going to go there this morning, all right? <laughs> Different times. Never God's plan, never God's best, always brought problems. And so they're like, David, this is, this is Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah. Um, that really should be the end of the conversation, but David says, give me her number. And so he gives her a call and he says, would you like to come to the palace? And she accepts the invitation. And you, most of you are familiar with the story, but David brings her there and I'm sure they had a great dinner on the rooftop. 
And then, of course, she spends the night and she goes home. And David thinks stolen bread tastes what? Sweet. It happened. It always happens. You see, David's perspective was the calories don't count if Uriah doesn't find out. Do you ever think that when you eat in secret, it doesn't matter, right? <laughs> you, know, you know people that are on a diet and they think, well, if I get up in the middle of the night and eat it, it won't matter. <laughs> right? The calories don't count if no one finds out. And that was David's perspective. I got away with this. I'm King David and I can do what I please. Until the moment when sin's euphoria is replaced with sin's reality. And I want you to know that sin's euphoria, the excitement, the thrill is always replaced with the reality of sin. Because here's the thing, sin is not just something you do or don't do. It's not just an action. Sin is spiritual. It's powerful. It's destructive. It's far, far greater than you realize and what its effect is on your heart and your soul and your life. And so stolen bread tastes sweet, but afterwards it turns to gravel in your mouth. How many of you have ever had the experience of having dirt in your mouth? All right. Wow. What are y'all doing? <laughs> it shouldn't be that many of you, but I'm glad it is because you get the illustration. Was it a pleasant experience? No. No. It's a hard, I mean, as, as pleasant as it is to have that hot, fresh donut in your mouth, right? And it is pleasant. It's exactly the opposite of having dirt in your mouth. It's about as far as you can get. There's nothing pleasant about dirt, the taste, the texture, nothing. And that's exactly what Solomon says sin is like. It's stolen bread tastes sweet, but afterwards it turns to gravel in your mouth. Here's what happens, 2 Samuel chapter 11. David has moved on. The calories haven't counted. He's living life. And all of a sudden he gets a text one day. And he sees the number and he thinks, I don't know this number. Who, who's giving out my number? Who, who's sending me this text? And he, he opens the text and it just says one word. Pregnant. And immediately he knows who it is. And now David has to make a choice. What do I do? with this situation. You see, we all face that choice because we've all sinned, right? We've all done things that we shouldn't do and we think we've hidden them well, but then we realize we may be getting found out. What do we do? So David makes a quick decision. I need to cover this up. And isn't that the decision that we make a lot of times? We try to cover our sin. We try to hide our sin, to pretend like it didn't happen instead of dealing with it. And so David makes the choice to cover his sin and he comes up with a great plan. I'm going to bring Uriah home and he'll spend the night with his wife and then he'll go back to battle. He'll find out she's pregnant and he'll think the kid is his. So he brings Uriah home and he asks him how things are going. He says, Uriah, I'm glad you're here. You know, why don't you go spend the night with your wife? Well, here's the thing. Uriah goes and sleeps at the gates of the town with some of his men. And David gets up the next morning and he can't believe it. And he says, Uriah, why didn't you, why didn't you go out and uh, spend the night with your wife and stay at home? And, and he says, well, how could I do that? He says, my men are out on the battlefield right now. They're fighting battles. They're not home with their wives and families. How could I go and enjoy the pleasure of being home in my bed with my wife when that's going on? And so David thinks, this is going to be a little harder than I thought. So he says, stay here one more night. So that night, he has Uriah to dinner, and he gets him drunk. Did you ever notice that when we make one bad decision, and then we're trying to cover it up, we just start making worse and worse choices? So he gets Uriah drunk, and he thinks, you know what, if I get Uriah intoxicated, he'll go home and sleep with his wife. So he gets him intoxicated, he sends him on his way, and in the morning he finds out, what? Uriah... Even an intoxicated Uriah has more honor than he does at this point. Even a drunk Uriah had more honor than David at this moment in his life. And even the intoxicated Uriah would not go back to his house. He stayed true to his commitment. And so David thinks, okay, let's, let's recalculate the plan. And so his plan is this. I will order Uriah to the front of a very hot battle. I will tell the troops to pull back 
Uriah will die and my sin will be covered. And so here's what David does. He, he writes the orders. Puts them in an envelope. Puts his seal on it. Gives it to Uriah. Nice guy, huh? He gives it to Uriah and he says, Uriah, take this. Don't, don't open this. And he knew Uriah wouldn't open it because he knew his honor. He says, take this to your commander. He did, and you know the story he did, and the, the plan went perfectly. And Uriah is killed in battle. And David takes Bathsheba to be his wife. And he moves on. And on the surface, it seems like he's gotten away with it. But you see, sin never ever is what we think. And it does something to our soul and to our heart. Because while everything was okay on the surface, on the inside, David was being eaten up. The reason I chose to share this story with you is because we get to have an amazing perspective from David himself on this situation. Because he wrote two very specific psalms that addressed his response to this situation. One of them is Psalm 51, and one of them is Psalm 32. Because David was experiencing the harsh reality of sin. On the outside, he had it all covered up, but on the inside, there was guilt, and there was the nagging, and the sleepless nights, and the shame that covered him like a cloud. And maybe you can identify with that this morning. Because maybe everything looks okay on the outside, but if you were real honest this morning, you'd say, I'm carrying some shame and some guilt because there's some things in my life that I know are not pleasing to God. There's some things that I've done. I've yielded to some of those hot now signs, and instead of dealing with it, I've covered it. And you understand exactly what David was feeling. Because here's the thing, we can hide it from our parents. I know you know how to hide things from your parents, right? Yes? I know they're videotaping it. You don't want to say it too loud because your parents might watch and think, I recognize that voice. <laughs> you know how to hide things from your friends. But you can't hide anything from God. He already knows. He sees and he knows everything that we do. And so our, our hiding of things is really quite foolish. But David keeps hiding it. Keeps letting it fester. Well, one day, God, in his mercy, says, I'm going to confront this. And so he sends Nathan, the prophet, to David. And Nathan tells a story. He says there was these two guys. One was really wealthy, and he owned lots and lots of sheep. And there was another man who was very poor. He owned one lamb. And this lamb was his pet. How many of you have a pet? All right. You love your pet? Do you miss your pet? All right. Well, this man loved his lamb. This lamb was not for, for, for food. It was his pet. Well, the rich man has dinner guests one day, and he doesn't want to kill any of his sheep, so he sends his servants over, and he says, go down to the poor guy's house and take his pet and kill it, and we'll serve it for dinner. And they do that. And so Nathan comes, and he tells this story to David, and David gets mad. I mean, he's angry, and he says, this guy deserves to die. Probably a little bit of an overkill, right? I mean, certainly the guy deserved punishment, but I don't know if he deserved execution. David says, here's the deal. After he calmed down, he says, this man shall have to repay four times. He needs to give this man four lambs back. And then Nathan looks at David. He says, David, it's you. David, it's you. You're the rich guy. The story's about you. And the Bible says that David was cut in his heart. And David decided at that moment, I'm going to come clean. I'm not going to hide it anymore. And he repented of his sin because you see, sin's euphoria is always replaced by sin's reality. Sin's euphoria is always replaced by sin's reality. And David finally comes to a place where he's going to do something about it. Look at Psalm 51 with me. If you have your Bible, you can turn there. Psalm 51. And again, this is just an amazing perspective because we get to, we get to read about David's own perspective on this whole situation. Psalm 51, verses 1 through 12. David says, Have mercy on me, O God. This is his prayer. This is his heart to God after he's been found out. He says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love and according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions and wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. He says, For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. He says, It is. I hid it, but it was always in my mind and in my heart. 
He says, against you and you only have I sinned. He realized although he had sinned against Bathsheba by leading her into sin, although he sinned against Uriah and his own family, ultimately his sin was vertical. Our sin is vertical first, always rebellion against God. He says, my sin against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. For behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother did conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities and create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. David finally comes clean and he runs to the God who alone he knows can forgive him. And he pleads for the mercy and the grace of God to cover his sin, to take away his guilt and his shame and his pain. And God does forgive him. Now, his sin did come with consequences for this lifetime. David's life was plagued with problems because of this sin. David came clean. And if you are hiding sin, I want you to know that you can come clean too. Psalm 32 is the other psalm that David writes about this. And he says, Blessed is the one whose, transgression, whose transgressions are forgiven. He says, joyful, happy is the idea there of that word. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Because are, be, be, Blessed are those whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as the heat of the summer. But then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. And I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. You see, if you've yielded to sin, one of the hot Nile signs of life has allured you. I want you to know that God is waiting for you to come clean. He's waiting for you to bring that to Him. Because here's the thing. He is a God who is full of grace and mercy. He is waiting to forgive you. He is waiting to cleanse you. He's waiting to relieve you of that guilt and that shame. And it might not... It might seem counterintuitive because you think, I'm just going to keep hiding it because that's easier, but it's not. It will only grow and fester in your soul. Coming clean can be embarrassing, it can be difficult, but it's always good. David's delay in coming clean is really what caused him the most consequences for his sin. The longer we delay, the worse it gets. Because here's the thing, the sin that we cover, God uncovers. The sin that we cover, God, he, he will expose your sin. Why? Not because He's mean, not because He's mad at you, but because He loves you. And He won't let you hide it forever. But here's the thing. The sin that we uncover, God covers. The sin that we uncover, God covers with His mercy and His grace. Stolen bread tastes sweet. Temptation, it's always going to be there. And like David, we're going to have to make choices. Am I going to yield to temptation or am I going to yield to God? And I want you to think about the cost of sin. Sin will take you further than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay. And it will cost you more than you want to pay. Sin always comes with a higher price tag than we expect. It always takes us further than we plan to go. Right? Sin is not something that we can manage. Right? We, we sometimes get to thinking that we can manage our sin, don't we? That, that I can commit this sin and that sin, and I can make myself an exception to the rule because... Right? Have you ever thought that you could be the exception to the rule? Anybody? All right. If you've ever looked at the list of rules and thought, I only have to keep half of these, what are you making yourself? An exception. We all have a tendency to do that. But you're not an exception to the rule. And so whatever it might be that you're hiding, that you're covering, God wants to set you free. Maybe you stayed when you should have left. Maybe you looked when you should have looked away. Maybe you clicked when you should have not clicked. 
Maybe you hurt when you should have helped. Maybe you sought to destroy when you should have lifted up. Whatever it is, it happened. And it's destroying you from the inside out. And God is waiting to forgive you. Grace is waiting. You see, that's the message of grace. God is waiting to forgive you. The same mercy and kindness that he showed you in saving you is still waiting for you. And he's wanting to clean up that area of your life. He's wanting to forgive you and to restore you. He wants to bring you back to the joy of walking close and clean before him. And so this morning, I want to ask you to probe your heart. David said, search me, O God. Know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me in the path of everlasting life. You can risk honesty with God because he already knows. He already knows. And he wants you to bring it to him. I think about the story of the prodigal son. And, and really the story of the prodigal son is about a prodigal God. right? Because prodigal means generous and extravagant. And we use it to describe the son who wasted his money, but it also describes the father, right? Because when the son came home, the father was waiting for him. And when he came home, the son was thinking, I, I, I got to handle, I got to fix this, so I'll just ask my dad to be a servant. But so you have to come to that place where you can't fix your sin. Only God can forgive your sin. And the father embraced the son. In his filth and in his shame. And he said, my son has come home again. We're going to party. We're going to get him some clothes and some shoes. And we're going to kill a cow. And we're going to have a party. We're going to have music and dancing. Because my son, which was lost, has been found. God is a God who delights in grace. And he wants to extend his grace to that area of your life that you have covered up. Coming clean is the answer to your guilt and to your shame. And so the question is, will you experience what David experienced? That joy and that peace. He says, blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven. Blessed are the ones whose sin has been covered by God. When we do, you'll experience the peace of God. You're in a perfect place to come clean. This is a, this is a safe place to come clean. You need to come clean before God, but you also might need to come clean with somebody. So that you can have the encouragement and the accountability that you'll need to deal with what you've dealt with. Your coming clean might need, mean that you need to have an apology for someone. But this is a perfect place to do it. Because there are people here that love you and that care about you. There are people here that will pray for you. Your counselors, your faculty, myself. Come to somebody and let God give you the freedom that you need. Would you bow your heads this morning for just a couple of moments? I just want to invite you to come clean, to risk being honest with God, to share the details. Why? Because grace is waiting for you. God's unlimited, unmerited grace, His willingness to forgive you, not because you deserve it, precisely because you don't deserve it. Jesus paid for that sin. Whatever it is that you're hiding, whatever it is that you're covering, Jesus paid for that sin on the cross. And right now, just in this moment, I just want you to picture Him there on the cross. He paid for that sin. He bore the shame that you're feeling. And He wants you to come to Him and come clean. And He wants you to find the joy and the peace and the grace that He can restore to you. Would you be willing to come clean this morning? Everybody's got their eyes closed. And I just want to ask you, would you be honest enough, just, just so that I could pray for you, would you raise your hand if you'd say, you know, I, I really feel convicted in my heart. There's something I've been hiding and I want to come clean. Would you raise your hand so that I can pray for you? Nobody's looking at you. Thank you so much for that courage. You can put your hand down. I want to pray for you. And I want to encourage you to do this. I want you to find time today to just spend alone with your Father in Heaven and come clean with Him. And here's the other thing I want to ask you to do. It's risky. But tell somebody. Because it will help you to break the power of that sin. To let someone else pray for you and remind you that God has forgiven you and to point you back to a better way of living for God's kingdom and glory. Father, I pray for each person that's here this morning. I thank you for the privilege that, that you've given me to be part of camp this year. Father, I thank you for your grace and your mercy and your love. And Father, I know that in life we all face hot now signs and sin can be so tempting and so alluring and sometimes we give in and we yield to temptation instead of to you. And Father, I pray that when 
we do, we would realize that we need to turn immediately back to you and to confess it and to deal with it and to experience your grace and your forgiveness and mercy once again. And Father, I just pray for each person specifically that raised their hand this morning who, who wants to come clean. Father, may they realize that they are running back to a God who's waiting for them, whose arms are open, whose love and grace and mercy are waiting to forgive and to cleanse and to heal and to restore and to set free. And Father, I pray that you'd help them to find the amazing forgiveness and peace and joy that only you can give. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.